I'm so glad nobody got up and left when she said, if you want to leave, leave right now. <laughs> so nicely done. Um, I'm Joelle. I run a strategy firm called Paradigm, and we work with technology companies on creating strategies to become more diverse, more inclusive. Companies like Pinterest, who are here in the room, awesome. Um, so I'm really excited to be on a panel today that helps us think about how we can leverage technology to make diversity solutions more scalable. Um, so I'm going to start by asking all of our panelists to uh, introduce themselves briefly. Just tell us a bit about you and your, what your company does. So we'll just go, yeah, we'll go left all the way down. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm, Kid I'm Kidar. Um, I'm the co-founder of Gap Jumpers. And the problem we're trying to solve is to eliminate the unconscious biases that exist in the resume screening process. And we do that by the sort of proven approach of using blind auditions. Uh, and so we run a technology platform that helps companies host blind auditions to eliminate any biases in the recruitment process and level the playing field for everyone. Great. My name is Laura Gomez, and I'm the founder and CEO of Atipica. And Atipica uh, started off as really being a diversity software product and we realized that recruiting itself is very broken and on those top of those layers um, sourcing and pattern matching are broken um, as far as candidate screening so we use data mining and machine learning to, un to get a transparent report on how companies are hiring so we have everything from startups that are a couple hundred employees to financial firms that are have 30,000 employees. So it's really about appropriating data. Hi, everybody. I'm, I'm Porter Braswell, and I'm the CEO of Jopwell, and we help companies hire ethnic minorities. So the way to think about it is that a lot of companies historically have said that while diversity is important, you know, where are the candidates? How can we kind of directly get in front of them? So we've essentially created a two-sided marketplace connecting top-tier diverse talent with companies in all industries, all sizes, and really just lever leveraging technology to, uh, to connect the two. Hello, my name is Deanna Kills, and I'm CEO of STEMMED. Um, and STEMMED uh, helps connect technology companies um, a lot here in Silicon Valley, but throughout the country, with uh, high potential STEM students from historically black colleges and universities. Uh, we do that by, we actually um, have formed university partnerships with the schools, and uh, we spend a tremendous amount of time on campus. So in essence, we are, for our clients, we are, in, we are increasing their on-campus reach by 15 to 20 historically black colleges and universities without them ever stepping foot on campus. And they are able to access students that are matched to them, and we match students to them um, based on assessments and interest inventories, and they are able to access pre-screens, um, assessments, and information about the student prior to deciding whether or not they would like to continue them in the interview process. So raise your hand if you're in this room, if you've ever heard a company say that the reason that they're not more diverse, that they're not doing better around diversity is that it's a pipeline problem. <laughs> yeah, all right, cool. Um, awesome, right? There are a lot of problems with that narrative. I think one problem is that we're, they're talking only about the STEM pipeline, and a lot of the population within these companies are not STEM employees, so that's an excuse that doesn't apply. Another problem is that um, people from underrepresented backgrounds are better represented in STEM programs than they are in these companies. So it seems to altogether be just a weird and, and flawed sort of excuse. Um, and I'm wondering, Porter and Deanna, you know, you have platforms that connect companies to people from underrepresented backgrounds, and I'm, I would love to hear sort of how you respond to this idea of it being a pipeline problem in either order. Sure. Um, well, for us, uh, you know, the reason we kind of started this is um, as we were, that was the feedback that we were getting. So my background is, um, has been in technical recruiting and worked for a lot of technology companies. And my last corporate role was head of global talent acquisition for a large Fortune 300 company. And in every company that I worked for, I was able to significantly impact diversity because it was a focus. And I measured it and I held people accountable for it. So when it comes to STEM and technology, um, one of the things that 
that I notice is with most of the companies I've worked with, um, going on HBCU campuses is kind of an afterthought. Um, typically, college recruiting is based on executives, alumni, or they look for a return on investment for prior years. And so if it was broken prior years, we're just going to keep using the broken process. So our um, you know, we've really challenged them is that what we are doing is giving you access. We're telling you there is an untapped pool that are qualified, high potential, already interested in tech jobs, and you aren't even scratching the surface. You're not even um, engaging those students. And so we'd like to help you connect. And we understand you can't go on every campus. Uh, we understand you can't, a lot of times it's resources. So let us serve as your referral partner. We will go on campus, we will represent you, we will understand your business needs and find students that are a good match for that. So that's really what we're doing. We're saying there is a pool. Now, of course, it can always be increased. Uh, I think none of us would argue that. But the pool that is there, we need to make sure that you're at least tapping into that pool um, before we can even continue the conversation. Yeah, so for us, um, so my background was in finance. Um, I started out in sales and trading. And I went to finance because that's all I pretty much was exposed to. I started working at Morgan Stanley when I, was in, when I was a junior and senior in high school. And then I spent three summers at Goldman Sachs in college. And then I started my career there. I was there for three years. And it sounds crazy now to kind of think about this. But when I was in college, that was really all, all, I, all I was exposed to. I knew I wanted to do sales, but I didn't realize I could do it in almost any industry. Um, so companies that say that you know there's a lack of a STEM pipeline, well, yeah, there, there, there is. And, and you know we're trying to build it. And that's going to take years and maybe decades to some degree. But what about everything else? What about sales? What about HR? What about legal? What about consulting roles within companies? There's so many other roles, especially for tech companies in general. A lot of the roles to some companies, the majority of roles don't require a STEM degree. So what about those jobs? What about now for those people and for, and for those candidates? So with Jobwell, we have a strong representation of people with STEM, back, STEM backgrounds on our platform, but we have everything else. And the reason why we built it the way that we built it is because I wish I had known that I can do sales at Adobe or sales at Pinterest, et cetera, et cetera. And I just wasn't really exposed to that. But now our candidates are on Jobwell. And so I think a lot of companies point to this lack of STEM as the reason for a lack of diversity it's kind of a cop out because there's so many other things and it's how do you ex expose those opportunities and, and those programs um, because the candidates are there. So it's just a matter of tapping into that pipeline and that's what we're trying to do with Jopwell, So. Laura, you've been in the tech industry for a while. You were at Twitter, then you were at Jawbone, right? Um, I'm interested in how your experience there and your experience in seeing how the recruiting process played out sort of uh, has contributed to the way that you're now trying to leverage technology to improve that process. Yeah, so I was uh, the first Latina hired at Twitter, and we were about 40 employees. This was almost seven years ago. Wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh, I feel old. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, what I actually applied to the wrong job at Twitter, and if it wasn't for the recruiter saying, hey, we think that you're a better fit for this job, and this happens a lot with people of color and women, we don't assess ourselves well enough to understand what job we should be applying. Mm -hmm. And this is where, the, where I believe that at Typica we can do that, is can algorithms say, hey, we've extracted information from your profile, your kind of profile resume, and we think that you're a better fit for these other jobs as well as a job you applied. And this comes from my own experience. I interviewed for, with both hiring managers, and they offered me both positions. And I, it was such a beautiful experience, I think, as far as a candidate. And I think all candidates, especially diverse candidates, we, we come in in such a broken process, and we're, we have this stigma pressure of, like, we're applying to a company. Um, with people interviewing us that don't look like us, sound like us, or even have the background like we do. And in that process, we there's so, as you probably know, resumes are so broken and like ageism and all these things. And so I think my experience was really, by the time I had left Twitter, there were 2,000 employees. So I had gone from 40 to 2,000 employees. And almost every other, early on, they would put me on a panel or an interview. So when I checked my applicant tracking system, I had interviewed 1,200 candidates by the time I had left. And I was like, that's 30 minutes of my time where I could have even been a better leader yeah. or a better employee. And it was, it was towards the inefficiencies that we have, especially we're growing. And so I think interviewing, and my organization was a number one feeder team. So but by the, my team grew to 20, and like by the time I left, 30 of those 
20 people that had originally hired art were like in other positions. So it was because I didn't look at the universities. I didn't care. I cared about how passionate they were about the problems we were trying to solve. So I think a lot of that comes in. Um, I also know that recruiting is really, really hard and that most recruiters want to talk to candidates. They don't want to source them. And so that's one of the solutions I'm trying to fix. It's exciting to see, thank you, it's exciting to see companies like Stand and Jopwell bringing so many more diverse candidates to companies. Um, and I think one of the big problems we see is unconscious bias uh, leading companies to evaluate those candidates in totally ineffective ways and not actually hire them. So uh, I think this is one of the problems that Gap Jumpers is trying to solve in a really interesting way. So I'd love to hear you talk about how that plays out, what, what your process actually looks like uh, between company and candidate and how you facilitate mitigating the effects of bias. Yeah, so there's no secret sauce there, yeah? Uh, everyone knows that in the 70s, the orchestra used blind auditions quite effectively mm -hmm. to fix their gender gap. So we use exactly the same principle, uh, wherein companies host blind audition challenges, which are a representation of what an applicant will be actually doing on the job as a way to determine if the person is the right one they should call in for an interview or not. So what companies essentially do <coughs> is eliminate the biggest source or avenue for bias, which is the resume, entirely from the pre-screening process, and use a blind audition instead. So you guys are very familiar with the TV show, The Voice, I'm guessing, where uh, <laughs> you know, uh, the judges pick people for their voice, because that's what is required on the show. And for an engineer, what's the most important skill? To be able to code a particular problem. For a designer, the most important challenge is to be able to design a particular solution. So that is what applicants today use as a way to demonstrate their performance, which is evidence-based, which is data-driven, which is not about proxies for skills, as opposed to an actual demonstration of what you can do and what you can deliver on the team. So it's about you know, bringing true meritocracy into the system rather than just you know, hearsay or what I think is meritocratic. Diana, you told me in an email that you use validated non-bias assessments. Yes. I think I got that right because I just checked it on my yes. phone. Because um, <laughs> I'm pretty sure I did. Yes. Um, to evaluate students. What does that mean? So um, one, of the, one of the things when we were looking at um, tech, the interview process, right? So one of the things that we really focus on campus is preparing students for the interview process. And you know, there are a lot of things about assessments that I uh, don't necessarily agree with. To me, there's not enough evidence that shows that how you perform on an assessment is a true reflection of your ability to do the job. And I, I can get on my horse about that, but I won't. Um, and so I figured it's a little, um, me being able to change that whole, it's such an integral part of so many companies uh, that what would be better would be for me to find good cognitive reasoning and, and good assessments um, that were validated non-biased, meaning that we have um, given the assessments across gender, um, ethnic backgrounds, nationalities, et cetera, and that they have been tested and reinforced that there is no bias. So not just based on, so of course people have will score differently, but we've actually made sure and put some time in making sure that there are no bias there. The other thing for us with the assessments is that since we're working across multiple campuses, so for some of our clients, you know, they have an internship. They can post an internship one time, it goes out to all of these HBCUs, right? So they're like, okay, that's fantastic. But when they're looking at students, they're all from different schools, so what common thread do we have to measure or rank? And so we use the assessments uh, for that reason also. Um, and then also with most of our corporate partners, we actually go in and do assessments with their top uh, performers. And we also, if in their top Performers. If there are not women and underrepresented, uh, then we also get a sample there as well. And so we look at building a profile. You know, we call it the perfect program or profile. Or, uh, but we look at what that profile looks like, and we are actually able to match students to them um, that have a similar assessment profile and present those students. And so now we're adding data and science uh, to this process. Um, so that's the reason why we added assessments. Awesome, and I think everyone on this panel thinks a lot about unconscious bias and how we mitigate its effects. One thing I'm always concerned about is how do we make sure that we're not sort of baking biases into the technology we're building? So for example, you know, we, 
you know, if we're uh, only thinking about, you know, what are the factors that we're using when we're connecting students to, to, to companies? Are we only looking at students from Ivy League schools where we know that people of color tend to be underrepresented? You know, MIT's undergraduate program is 3% black overall, as opposed to undergraduate programs nationwide, which are 15% African American. So um, how do we think about um, making sure that the systems, the structures we're creating don't have biases baked in? And Laura, I'd love to start with you, because I know that what you're doing is partly helping companies mine um, their data to find applicants. How do you make sure that the way that you do that um, sort of isn't doesn't have some of those biases baked in. Yeah, and I definitely agree with you that sometimes it's, especially with machine learning, is like it, you're leaving it up to the computer to do the predictive screening for for the client. And we started off by being like, okay, let's just anonymize the names. Will that create a way uh, to? to remove the biases that are there and the universities. So nowadays we do ask our clients to choose from 15 trends within a resume that they would like to surface in their analytics and we tend to tell them to shy away from schools and names and to really just focus on, on really the, the, ta the skill set that that resume may have. Um, I was, this morning there was like, a whole study done that teachers themselves grade girls test lower if they know it's a girl's name attached to it. So even when we don't have, when we purposely don't want to be biased, we, there may be just a trend in us being humans. And so how can we make sure that the algorithm keeps that in check and, and allows us to really see the talent? And so we present, we, we think the resume is broken. It's 533 years old. <laughs> Leonardo da Vinci invented it, if anyone wants to know. <laughs> um, so. I really love that Mona Lisa, but we shouldn't be using uh, their resume after 533 years. Uh, and it's a timeline model, and there's so many biases, so we present it in a different way. So when we present it in graphs, we're like, oh, here's a resume, but it's really a graph that you see. That being said, it's also, if I don't, I think, as I think as a woman of color and Latina, and so like I realize now that I have a more diverse team, that they're keeping me in check with my own biases about how I want to <laughs> break the biases. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I, I go back to I think there's a, a hotel in Atlanta that like literally like uh, I think African American you can't they can dispense the soap the Afri to African Americans, and so the guy brought in his friend is like, hey Jeff, like dispense the soap, and so like they and they did it, and then I read the scientific why because they probably didn't have a product manager of color or they didn't have someone in that team that said we should test against the pigment as the dispenser of the soap. And it's, it wasn't because the soap dispenser is racist. Right, right. There was no one there. No one there to think. There was no one there to actually understand like where the technology needs to be kept in check. On, and so I think that that goes, like I was really mad that I couldn't tweet like an emoji with the couple and a family, because you can't tweet with like a brown emoji. Then I realized as I tweeted and my friend came in and he's like, oh, this is actually because of the Unicode and engineering. And so I think like instead of making assumptions that technology is going to not going to be used for the purpose of diversity, it's rather where are the limitations of technology, but you also need the human and the technology to talk to each other so we don't get ahead of ourselves. And Kadar, I'd love to hear from you on sort of the same idea too, because a lot of what you're doing is like, what you're doing is trying to mitigate unconscious bias or take unconscious bias out of the process. And how do you evaluate your own structure to make sure that there may not be, that there aren't biases baked in there? Yeah, and, and so, um, so one of the things we do is we keep ourselves also blind to the performance of the applicants on our own platforms. Um, so what, is it, what does that mean? Um, so like I said, a performance audition is one that helps applicants have a very seamless and enjoyable experience, first of all, because it's not about sending in the 100th resume onto the 100th website to the 100th job that I'm applying to. So for, for an applicant, it's about being committed and motivated. So we're trying to use design thinking principles to make sure the experience on both sides is enjoyable and one that is truly meritocratic. With respect to the ranking of the audition performance 
process itself. Um, we look at signals that, are, that have a binary yes, no kind of answer. For example, the way we measure creativity uh, amongst a bunch of submissions. So let's take, say, you know, everyone on this panel took a blind audition to one of the challenges you guys posted. Um, the way we would measure creativity is the only person on this, from these submissions who had something different from the rest of us would be the one that is most creative. So it's a binary outcome. Difference can be measured. Things that can be measured with a binary outcome are the things that we bake in to the ranking of the responses. So it is not based on what I feel or you feel. Anyone can measure 2 plus 2 is 4. And those are the things we use in our ranking to, uh, to rank the responses. But at the end of the day, I think it's the hiring manager who looks at these performances who is the best judge to see if I like performance one or performance three. Because at the end of the day, that's the person who's looking for evidence which is related to the work that this person will be doing on the job, not based on my perception of quality. So we, we leave a certain element to human judgment, which is evidence-based rather than, uh, say, a proxy or a word or an adjective. Fascinating. Raise your hand if, in here, you represent recruiting, HR, or diversity functions at a company. OK, a lot of people. So I'm really curious from the folks on the panel, and I'll start with you, Porter. Um, when you pitch a company, uh, do you make kind of, you know, maybe the company isn't so sure how it wants to invest around diversity yet. Do you make a business case for diversity? Um, I hear companies that are motivated by primarily business concerns. I, I know companies that are motivated by sort of social justice instincts. And I'm wondering what the case is that you make. Yeah. It's such a company by company decision. Um, I think the more established companies um, have more of a diversity initiative already in place, and now it's, they need a, a tool to enhance that. Other companies that reach out to us are much earlier stage, and they're trying to think about diversity because they want to get to a point where they can um, get ahead of it before they get to a thousand person company. So, so at that stage, they're asking us, OK, so how should we even think about implementing a diversity strategy? And, and, and we can go about it that way. And then there's other companies that have that have good diversity numbers, um, and they do a good job at it, and they invest a lot of money in it. But even still, there's this element of you still have to like leverage tools, and, and, and if we can leverage technology to make it even easier, then they continue to have great diversity numbers. So it's such a company by company conversation that we have, but it comes down to just listening to what they want. And I typically start every meeting just saying, so tell me about how you guys think about diversity. And then from there, I can best you know, figure out how Drop can fit into that. So. I would recommend even not saying you guys because. Oh, there you go. And I, and you I, might get a better reception even. And I appreciate you pointing that out. There's things like that. And I think, and I truly appreciate you pointing that out because that needs, that, those conversations need, like those uncomfortable, not that that was uncomfortable, but yeah. Yeah. Uncomfortable, yeah. uncomfortable conversations in the workplace need to happen. People need to start engaging in, in that type of, you know. Totally. And I, I will be the first one to say I catch myself saying you guys still. I, it, it's, okay. These are habits that we develop, and no one should feel yeah. like they're a bad person yeah. when they get called out for this yeah. stuff. I'm working on it myself. Mm -hmm. Another thing I get called out for sometimes is interruption. I interrupt other women a lot. This is a common pattern. We all need to be aware of our own patterns and be kind of comfortable doing that and being like, thank you for pointing that out. Totally good point. So but one, you handled one, it very well. well thank one you. More thing I've, <laughs> one more thing. When people send emails, um, and we do this a lot on, on my team, the one thing that drives me crazy, if somebody on my team sends an email to a company and they start it with, I just want X, or I just want to ask you for whatever, the ju that word just drives me insane. Yeah. And it's such a, it's such a thing where, where, again, there's a lot of reasons why it drives me insane, but mm. it's this passive thing that I think that diverse people, maybe to some degree, always come off as kind of passive yeah. in some areas. So, Although I, I will say, though, like, I think it's a really good point, yeah. but I use just a lot, and I think there are a lot of patterns that 
people from underrepresented backgrounds and women develop because they've found that they work for them, it makes me maybe less yeah. threatening and I get a better response when I do that. Yeah. So I hear why it's annoying, but I also think we have to be a little bit careful to tell people from underrepresented backgrounds, change the way you talk, because sometimes we adopt these for subconscious but actually pretty savvy reasons because they've worked better for us than saying, hey, this is what I need. Yeah. People don't like when, when women speak like that. People may not like when people of color speak like that, women of color. So I think, I don't know, I kind of like to let people use the strategies that they find work, but I, yeah. I, I hear you though. That's just, I don't know. Yeah. Um, sorry, sorry for the tangent. <laughs> um, Diana, but I also wanted to hear how you talk about diversity and whether you make the business case, the social justice case, how you talk about it with companies. Yeah, so um, for us, it's, it's kind of twofold. So out here, uh, you know, we do, so we, I'm actually, we're headquartered out of Atlanta. We have a West Coast team also. Um, and we are actually, um, one of our, our first investors is Georgia Tech. So we're actually have office space. We're on Georgia Tech campus. And so it's, it's perfect for us because most of the HBCUs are on the southeast. So we're in a good kind of central location. And we come out here a lot, right? And so what we're um, doing, so for those of you that are familiar with kind of HBCUs, the central part of HBCUs is called the yard. And that's where they do like all the Greek and stepping. So our slogan for them is from the yard to the valley um, and, and forming that connection uh, for them. So when we talk to companies uh, about diversity, diversity out here, we don't really have to go, we don't have to do the business case for it as much because there's been a lot of attention um, about it. However, we do work with um, some very, very large Fortune 50, 100 companies in the Atlanta area, just Southeast in general. Um, and we do sometimes find ourselves, they tend to be a little bit more diverse just because of where they're located. But when we really, really talk about the business um, case for it, uh, we had a great conversation about Twitter. Um, I was talking uh, to them, and you know, there's this whole phenomenon of Black Twitter, and I don't know if everybody knows what Black Twitter is, but it's kind of this, uh, all these hashtags and things being ratchet and this and that, and you know, it's, it's very hip hop culture influence, but it is a huge user base, um, and the the potential there is great as consumers. And so if your team, just as you mentioned, is not diverse there and doesn't get it and doesn't, isn't able to speak to it, then from a business perspective, that's an issue because that is uh, would affect you know, your advertising, uh, potentially revenue opportunities, et cetera. So it's important, I think, you know, as minorities and as women, as we are a part, we are a large part of the buying power and the consumers of things. Things. And if we do not begin being the producers and makers of things, they will not be relevant to us in our communities and relevant to us in life. Um, and we have a habit of just making do, right? So we, we, we fit in. And that's what I love about millennials. You know, they're like, uh, yeah, no, we're, no. And I remember when I came out of college, uh, being the only woman, being the only black woman, um, conversations that went on that probably weren't appropriate. Um, I was kind of taught, you know, to have a, a blind eye, unless it was just, you know, really blatant, but it was, but it was a blind eye. Now I hear uh, millennials coming in and they're like, even if there's not mixed company and someone says something, they're correcting them, they're calling them on it. Um, and that's so important. And I think because of that, things are starting to change. That's why we can have conferences, you know, like, like this and have conversations like this. So I know that it's getting better and with companies like ours, I think we're just going to help that move a little quicker. Laura and Kadar, actually, you know, one thing I think a lot about is you're, you're taking bias out of a process and you're probably enabling people to get hired who may not otherwise have gotten hired at these companies. How do you think about the fact that those people may be joining organizations where there, there's so much unconscious bias and decision making that they might not have even gotten hired otherwise and setting those organizations maybe up for success to be better places for those folks to work once they get there. For me, my concern is that a lot of, especially people of color, and even my, myself and women, we tend to apply directly online. So even if there is a referral system, like we don't go and ask for the referral, refer me. And so a lot of diverse candidates are sitting on, in the databases of all these companies. And that's where I, I say, hey, how about before you go reach out to LinkedIn and go to LinkedIn to try to find a diverse candidate based upon their picture. <laughs> and I do know, 
I do know someone that does this, and I think you can attest that there's recruiters out there that are like diversity recruiters that are actually looking for people that look a certain <laughs> color. <laughs> Which, before they do that, it's like, do you think that they've already applied? Are they in your, in your system? And I think that that's the first level where people are like, whoa, like a lot as you're mining your own data within, it's a lot of people that don't have access to the network and the ones that are not getting referred. I think going back, it breaks my heart sometimes because I have a lots of friends of all ages and colors and backgrounds that end up applying to these tech companies and the things that they get back, like you're not a culture fit. Mm -hmm. And this is a, a very good friend of mine who's African American male. Yep. And it breaks my heart when I hear that. And I was like, and to your point, I was like, did you hold them accountable? Because I know the head of the BP of HR of there, because she, I'm going to email right. her and tell right. her, like your recruiters are telling people they're not a culture fit. But at the end of the day, I do think that the more that we prepare ourselves and we hack our own knowledge, I remember I was coaching a Latina applying to Facebook. It's like, I think I'm too good for this job. And I'm like, and you're not going to say that. <laughs> you're going to go and say, my potential is this and this. And this is, what you're, and this is the verbiage that Facebook people want to hear. You're going to help them get to the 2 billion user and all this stuff. She got the job. Three months later, she was promoted to a better position that fits her background. But it was really about the knowledge transfer and hacking our own information so that other, that I can only do so much in mining resumes, but once they get in the door, it's about all these other amazing startups that are out there that are doing other things, including yourself within the, the organization themselves, different interviewing skills and assets that, and not just here in this panel, but a lot of HR tech companies are tackling. Yeah, anything to give thought? I, actually, I have a very uh, counterintuitive uh, uh, point to make here. Um, the perception is that when people from unconventional backgrounds enter the workplace, the workplace can be hostile, can be uncomfortable, can be one that they're not used to. That is true if you use an approach that is not skills first. If you use an approach to select them based on their performance and not based on who they are, then we found that people have a positive bias towards them. So let, I'll give you an example, concrete example. We had. Uh, we had a student at applying to a company which typically only accepts or only accepted people who have a master's degree. And you know, if you don't have a master's in computer science, you're not eligible to apply to this position. Um, but through a blind audition process, this applicant got in who was from a community college. And not only was this person from a community college, did not even do a computer science degree. <laughs> now, I, I, now, this hiring manager, purely based on the performance of this applicant, feels empathy, feels respect, appreciates their, their, their talent, because it's almost like, you know what, I've switched uh, the, the switch in their head to say, you know what, I have shown you evidence that this person's really good. And then it turns the table around, where people in, the, in, in, in an organization want to see evidence. And if they see that, um, they're actually more empathetic, and especially to young Young people who walk in the door, that's a great way to start the first job or the second job at a company because that's, they're the ones who are going to be future leaders. And if you appreciate them for who they are and what they bring to the table as opposed to their background, you know, it's a company set up for success. Cool. Glad that you found that. I would love to see more about that data. I, I, I have a hard time believing that some of the kind of racism and sexism disappears when people see that you're qualified because I think women and people of color have been showing themselves to be qualified for a long time, but I'd love to learn more about that. Um, so we have only five minutes left, so I'd love to just open it up for maybe we have time for like one or two questions from the audience. Addy. Hi, everyone. Um, one thing that I'm, I work at Pinterest, one thing that we're struggling with right now is the lack of diversity around referrals. And I think we know in the Valley, um, this is one of the least, pipeline, least diverse pipelines. And so I'm curious, you all have found a way to use technology to try to solve the pipeline problems. If you have any technology ideas or ways that you're thinking of adapting your platforms to deal with the lack of diversity in referrals. 
Well, I know for, for us, that was a, a big focus. Just like I said about my uh, about the assessments, it's like one of those things, uh, employee, coming from a recruiting background and, and running recruiting departments, I know there is no argument about the effectiveness of employee referrals. You tend to get candidates that are better fit, they tend to stay longer, and the process is shorter, and great talent tend to hang around other great talent. Um, but also, if you have a very, um, if you don't have a diverse workforce, then typically the referrals are not either, right? So one of the things that we've done is that we are, part of the reason we're really, really focused on internships is because we are um, bringing students in for internships as early as between freshman and sophomore year, um, all the way up, and our we tell them, the. Most of these companies that we work with, 80 to 85% of their hiring is employee referrals. What we're doing is we want to position you to get a great internship and go and kick butt in this internship. Do a great job, meet people. We talk to them about networking, about having lunch and coffees and getting to know people, um, especially those that are coming here on the West Coast in Silicon Valley. Use this time. And then once you've worked there, um, for a, you, you now become part of that pool that will be referred for next summer or for when it's time to graduate. Graduate. So really, what we've um, we've even kind of we were talking to companies early while they're in college. We want we want them to look at us as a trusted referral partner um, to kind of serve the where their employee referrals are because we work very close with our clients. We understand their culture, what they're looking for, and we're going to find students that are a good fit and refer them. And then the hope is that once they get in internships and co-ops, they become part of your employee referral uh, pool going forward. I would love to, I, I know probably other people have other thoughts, but I'd love to just make sure we can get one more question in just to get another voice heard. Thank you. Um, so, so I'm Linda Parker Pennington, and I, you know, I was hoping this panel would also talk about uh, using technology to address the issue of inclusion and the culture in organizations, because as I'm sure you know, it's one thing to attract diversity, to not, another thing to hang on to them. So, you know, when I went to Google in 2007, after getting up off the floor when the recruiter called me, I said, I've never seen anybody who looked like me in Google. And then, you know, we started the BOLD program and recruited people from HBCUs, but they were like deers in the headlights. Yes. And so, and most of the people I knew then are no longer there. Yes. So, you know, I'm just wondering, if you have some solution, there's a guy next to me here with a company uh, called Culture Amp. Yeah. So I'm going to plug him for a second yeah. because they, I think they have a solution that helps a little bit. But how do your um, applications and the work that you're doing help with the retention piece as well as the getting piece? Probably just have time for That's one gonna, person. Yeah, so. I don't want to. Yeah. We, we kind of address, and I'll keep it short in case someone else wants to. So um, excellent point. And so again, we are working directly with companies as well. And when we work with these college students, I always tease them because we're in the South. We're like, these are our babies. We're not sending them into an environment um, that will not be a favorable experience for them because it will affect their decisions around employment for the rest of their life. Um, so we literally take the time uh, to go in. We're meeting with hiring managers, we're understanding the teams, and we're also bringing students. So one of the things this year we're working on, sending some students out for spring break, et cetera. But around how they treat them once they come, I think that that really, there are some great consulting companies that are doing some good work there. I run um, one of them. Yeah, I was going to say, Joelle's <laughs> company uh, it works on that. But we make it very much a point um, that if we're going to continue this relationship, which is another good part about doing internships and early, you want us to continue sending students. All of our students do a monthly, um, they, they rank, they give us feedback, we get feedback from the managers, we share them with both. And so if we notice things, we address them right away. So that's the only way we'll continue our partnership uh, with them. So it doesn't solve everything, but again, there's some great consulting companies like Joelle's that certainly help with that. One, one thing really quick, Abby, I have a friend that does a third party referral saying he has an option for diversity. He hasn't gotten it. Like he goes and presents it and people are like, oh no, no, we just want it. And he uses data science. So I think I can attest to him what he's doing. Second, I think the inclusion part is going to be the hardest problem to solve. Like we're all standing here with recruiting options that we are able to get there. It's the inclusion part that's going to be the hardest to solve. There's some amazing technology being built. I think Joel and I know a female entrepreneur that looked at how meetings were scheduled just for teams and emails. And then if someone's a performance review came out lawyer, been like, well, you didn't invite 
her or this person to this meeting because we looked at your Gmail account and you excluded them from these meetings because those are options. And I think that's going to be harder to prove, I think, as technology goes on. And like, where does technology give you so much insight? And where can you take that and still bring in the human? I think that's the hardest part. I wouldn't go back right now. Right now, I wouldn't go back to work for, for working for a tech company. Um, that's not an entrepreneur because I think that's the hardest problem to solve. I'm so sorry, we're over time. Find these awesome people on LinkedIn, pay them to come work with your companies. Um, and thank you all so much. <laughs>